We have not done nearly enough to address this crisis. We are going to have to do more. And whether that happens or not, to a large degree, is going to depend on you. Not just those of you in this room, but anybody who's watching or reading a transcript of what I say here today. That was true six years ago as well. You know, in Paris, our goal was to turn progress into an enduring framework that would give the world confidence in a low-carbon future, an agreement where countries would update their emissions targets on a regular basis, an agreement that would help developing nations get the resources they need to skip the dirty phase of development and help those nations that are most vulnerable to climate change get the resources they need to adapt. An agreement that would give businesses and investors the certainty that the global economy is on a firm path towards a clean and sustainable future. In other words, our hope was to create an agreement that gave our planet a fighting chance. That was our ambition. And by some measures, the agreement has been a success. For the first time, leaders of nearly 200 nations, large and small, developed and developing, made a commitment to work together to confront a threat to the people of all nations. And that seemed proof that for all the divisions in our world, when a crisis threatens all of us, we can come together to address it. At the time, we also believed that if enough national governments showed they were serious about climate, then other institutions, particularly in the private sector, would start raising their sights as well. And over the last six years, that is what's happened. Today, more than one-fifth of the world's largest companies have set net zero emissions targets, not just because it's the right thing to do for the environment, but in many cases because it makes sense for their bottom line. More than 700 cities in more than 50 countries have pledged to cut their emissions in half by the end of the decade and reach net zero by 2050. About a third of the global banking sector has agreed to align their work with the Paris Agreement. So that's meaningful. Now, back in the United States, of course, some of our progress stalled when my successor decided to unilaterally pull out of the Paris Agreement in his first year in office. I wasn't real happy about that. And yet, the determination of our state and local governments, along with the regulations and investment that my administration had already put in place, allowed our country to keep moving forward, despite hostility from the White House. The $90 billion investment that we made in 2009 helped to jumpstart the clean energy industry in the United States, and markets adapted, and so did consumers. And even when the Trump administration rolled back emissions requirements for automakers, along with regulatory changes and efficiency standards, many businesses chose to stay the course. They kept reducing emissions. They continued the transition to electric vehicles and energy-saving appliances. The ball had been rolling, and it didn't stop. And meanwhile, science and technology continued to advance. So today, the price of solar and wind energy has dropped to the point where, in some places, clean energy is cheaper than fossil fuels. Around the world, scientists and entrepreneurs are integrating abundant renewable energy, more powerful batteries, breakthroughs in fields like synthetic biology to invent a better future that is healthier and more affordable. That's all good news for the planet. And it is also good news for people looking for a job. In the U.S. alone, more than 3 million people now work in clean energy-related jobs. That is more than the number of people currently employed by the entire fossil fuel industry. So despite four years of active hostility toward climate science coming from the very top of our federal government, 
The American people managed to still meet our original commitment under the Paris Agreement. And not only that, but the rest of the world stayed in the deal. And now, with President Biden and his administration rejoining the agreement, the U.S. government is once again engaged and prepared to take a leadership role. And everybody who's been watching John Kerry run around here knows that we take that role seriously. As the world's second largest emitter of greenhouse gases, the U.S. has to lead. We have enormous responsibilities. And obviously, we still have a lot of work to do. But last week, Congress passed President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure bill that will, among other things, create manufacturing uh, create jobs manufacturing solar panels and wind turbines and batteries and electric ve vehicles and build out the first ever national network of charging stations so families can travel across the U.S. in electric vehicles. And I'm confident that a version of President Biden's Build Back Better bill will pass through Congress in the coming next few weeks. And here's what it will mean when that bill does pass. That legislation will devote over half a trillion dollars to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by over a billion metric tons by the end of the decade, at least 10 times more than any legislation previously passed by Congress. Along the way, it will reduce consumer energy costs, it will invest in a clean energy economy, it will create hundreds of thousands of jobs, and it will set the United States on course to meet its new climate targets achieving a 50 to 52 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions below 2005 levels by 2030. So the U.S. is back. And in moving more boldly, the U.S. is not alone. Earlier this year, the U.K. government, our hosts, announced a plan to cut emissions by almost 80 percent by 2035. This summer, the European Union put themselves on a path to carbon neutrality by 2050. Korea passed a Carbon Neutrality Act in September that requires the government to cut greenhouse gas emissions 35 percent or more by 2030. The Canadian government has laid out a path to carbon neutrality by 2050 with milestones to hit along the way. So. Paris showed the world that progress is possible, created a framework. Important work was done there, and important work has been done here. That is the good news. Now for the bad news. We are nowhere near where we need to be yet. For starters, despite the progress that Paris represented, most countries have failed to meet the action plans that they set six years ago. And the consequences of not moving fast enough are becoming more apparent all the time. Last month, a study found that 85 percent of the global population has experienced weather events that were more severe because of climate change. Stronger storms, longer heat waves, more intense flooding, crippling droughts. Parts of the world are becoming more dangerous to live in, triggering new migration patterns and worsening conflict around the globe. It's one of the reasons why uh, the U.S. Pentagon and other U.S. agencies have said that climate change poses a national security threat for the U.S. and for everyone else. But not only did we not hit all of the targets that were pledged in Paris, but remember, Paris was always supposed to be a beginning, not an end point, of our joint effort to control climate change. Back in 2015, we knew that even if the commitments made as a part of the Paris Agreement were fully met, we would still fall short of our goal of keeping global temperature increases below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that's why Paris was designed to be a framework for countries to constantly ratchet up their ambitions as they got more resources and as technology reduced the cost of transitioning to a clean energy economy. So we come now here to Glasgow, and just was as true with the Paris Agreement 
there is good news and bad news about what has happened here this past week. The good news, in large part because of the efforts of the people in this room, the hours of work that you spent with you know, weak coffee and bad food and feeling sleepy. Because of you, countries around the world are recognizing this is a decisive decade to avoid a climate disaster and are setting some really important goals for 2030. More than 100 countries this past week have committed to reduce methane emissions by 30 percent by 2030. As all of you know, curbing methane emissions is currently the single fastest and most effective way to limit warming. More than 100 countries have also promised to stop and reverse deforestation by the end of 2030. Businesses from around the world, name brands, some of the biggest businesses on this planet have agreed to help create a market for the technologies we need to transition to clean energy. Here in Glasgow, nations have also committed to help poor countries move away from fossil fuels and deal with the effects of climate change. President Biden announced that the U.S. will be quadrupling its annual climate finance pledge over the next few years to $11 billion, including $3 billion dedicated to helping vulnerable countries adapt to the impacts of climate change. And the U.S., along with 20 other countries, agreed to stop publicly financing international fossil fuel development with limited exceptions. So these are significant accomplishments. They are hard-won commitments. You should be proud of yourselves, and we need to celebrate those commitments, even as we demand that the signatories to these commitments actually follow through. We have to track it. They're not self-executing. They're going to require effort. But let's assume that we actually delivered. That's significant. But once again, we also have to acknowledge that this progress is partial. Most nations have failed to be as ambitious as they need to be. The escalation, the ratcheting up of ambition that we anticipated in Paris six years ago has not been uniformly realized. I have to confess, it was particularly discouraging to see the leaders of two of the world's largest emitters, China and Russia, decline to even attend the proceedings. And their national plans so far reflect what appears to be a dangerous lack of urgency, a willingness to maintain the status quo on the part of those governments. And that's a shame. We need advanced economies like the U.S. and Europe leading on this issue. But you know the facts. We also need China and India leading on this issue. We need Russia leading on this issue, just as we need Indonesia and South Africa and Brazil leading on this issue. We can't afford anybody on the sidelines. I recognize we're living in a moment when international cooperation has waned. A moment of greater geopolitical tension and stress, in part because of the pandemic, in part because of the rise of nationalism and tribal impulses around the world. And yes, in part because of a lack of leadership on America's part for four years on a host of multilateral issues. I understand that it's harder to get international cooperation. There are more global tensions. But there is one thing that should transcend our day-to-day -day politics and normal geopolitics, and that is climate change. It's not just that we can't afford to go backward. We can't afford to stay where we are. The world has to step up, and it has to step up now. So how is that going to happen? How do we close the gap between what's necessary for our survival and what seems politically possible right now? 
I confess, I don't have all the answers. As I'm sure is true for all of you out there, those of you who are steeped in this work, who are far more expert than me, there are times where I feel discouraged. There are times where the future seems somewhat bleak. There are times where I am doubtful that humanity can get its act together before it's too late. And, and, and images of dystopia start creeping into my dreams. And yet, whenever I feel such despondency, I remind myself that cynicism is the recourse of cowards. We can't afford hopelessness. Instead, we are going to have to muster the will and the passion and the activism of citizens pushing governments, companies, and everyone else to meet this challenge. That's what allowed the U.S. to do its part over the last few years to meet our climate goals, even when we didn't have much leadership on it. It wasn't just elected officials or CEOs doing the right thing. It was ordinary Americans making their voices heard, making it clear we need to solve this problem regardless of the obstacles. People who organized and educated others in their communities, people who put pressure on businesses and governments to do better, people who turned their passion into votes. That's the kind of commitment we're going to need going forward. Because let's face it, this is not just about raw numbers. This is not just about science. This is about politics. It's about culture. It's about morality. It's about the human dynamic. How do we work together to get a big thing done? And it's about participation and power. Thinking back on my own experience as president, I would have had the power to do even more to fight climate change during my time in office if I'd had a stable congressional majority that was willing and eager to take action. And for the bulk of my presidency, I didn't have that majority. Gaining such majorities require an engaged citizenry willing to do what it takes to reward politicians who take this problem seriously and send out of office those who don't. I am convinced that President Biden's Build Back Better bill will be historic and a huge plus for U.S. action on climate change. But keep in mind, Joe Biden wanted to do even more. He's constrained by the absence of a robust majority that's needed to make that happen. Both of us have been constrained in large part by the fact that one of our two major parties has decided not only to sit on the sidelines, but express active hostility toward climate science and make climate change a partisan issue. Perhaps some of you have a similar dynamic in your own countries, although Generally speaking, uh, the United States seems to have a, John, a, a, a more vigorous opposition to climate than in many other places. But my broader point is that that's got to stop. Saving the planet isn't a partisan issue. I welcome any faction within the Republican Party in the United States that takes climate change seriously. And that may be a rare breed right now, but Keep in mind, such Republican elected officials used to be commonplace, used to exist. President George H.W. Bush, a Republican, was one of the first U.S. presidents to officially recognize the threat of climate change, was a signatory to the Rio Accord. If we are going to act on the scale that's required, climate change can't be seen anywhere in the world as just an opportunity to score political points. And for those listening back home in the U.S., let me say this. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat. If your Florida house is flooded by rising seas, 
or your crops fail in the Dakotas, or your California house is burning down. Nature, physics, science do not care about party affiliation. And what is true in the United States is true in every nation. We don't just need the Democrats or the Green Party or progressives to be working together on this existential problem. We need everybody, even if we disagree on other things. And what's also true around the world, true in the U.S., true in all the countries represented here, is that the most important energy in this movement is coming from young people. 